Hey, uh, John, uh, a very good friend. Uh, and I'm always excited to talk to you uh, about Cassandra and related technologies. Uh, we all know you are involved in many different roles. Uh, you are Apache Cassandra committer. Uh, you are a very active community speaker. Uh, you, you're not talking about Cassandra. And you worked at uh, some of the very large companies who use Cassandra. So uh, the idea here is to just uh, have a chit chat and learn from your experiences. Um, also, we want to know some background. So we'll get into some questions like, you know, where did you grow up and all. Uh, so let's get started. All so right. first, tell let's us, <laughs> first, <laughs> first tell us when you were very young, um, you know, the school years, let's say elementary school to high school, uh, mm -hmm. where did you live uh, during uh, those times? Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up, first of all, let me just say, thanks for having me on, man. I uh, I, I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's it's good to, you know, have a, have a chat with you about this stuff. And, uh, you know, I really do appreciate you having me here. Um, I, I grew up in this small town in uh, Massachusetts called Seekonk. It's like a population, maybe 12,000 people. And it uh, used to be a lot of farmland, very, very small town, kind of not really a ton uh, going on. Um, but it was kind of the thing about it that was really interesting that sort of set me up for, for my career was, you know, I was born in, in 1981. And so at that kind of time, I'm in elementary school, that's when uh the apple 2e the apple 2gs uh had, had just become um available and so you know as a kid i was really i was really into math and we had uh i remember we had our apple 2e and i ended up getting really into number munchers i don't know if you ever played number munchers i loved number munchers it was it was amazing i had the uh the leaderboard for every single like you know every, every single thing that you you could think of I, I went in and just filled out the leaderboard and um and then my my parents uh bought an apple 2gs and and then later on a performa 6300 and my mom handed me this book that came with it it was like programming applesoft basic and that literally the, this one moment you know, it just kind of set me off on this path that that forever changed my life. And uh, I taught myself basic and and I loved it. And then um, I bought I saved up from like, you know, mowing lawns. I saved up to the two hundred dollars, which was crazy amount of money at the time when you're in when you're in high school uh, to buy the MetroWorks C plus uh, the C compiler. It wasn't even C plus plus at the time. It was just C. So I taught myself C and, uh, you know, I'm like 14 years old, 15 years old. I'm like learning this stuff. I don't know what people know. I think everybody knows this stuff. And then I show up in college and it turns out that like nobody knew this stuff, like almost nobody that I think maybe two guys that I, I was in school with had, uh, any experience doing it before. Um, and at this, at this time I, I went up to the university of Vermont. Uh, which was a really great school. I, I had a really great time there, and I love. I really got a lot out of the, the CS program. Um, but yeah, that that was how. That, that's kind of like my my origin story, um, you know. So by the time by the time I got to college, I already had ten thousand hours programming because wow. I, I love. I fell in love with it. So that's all I did as a kid. Like I was one of those kids that like you know had the computer at home, and I'm just like working away and like figuring out data structures and building like binary trees uh, and, and learning how all that stuff worked. And then I got to school and it turns out that like they were teaching that in like sophomore year and junior year, you, you kind of get into some, some of that type of thing. And I, you know, it, it was really interesting for me because uh, I, I, I basically gave myself the first few years of a college level education uh, while I was, you know, freshman or sophomore in, in high school. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. The, so there are a couple of couple of things you touched upon. Like, you know, uh, one is, I don't know if you knew this. Um, I lived in Watertown, Massachusetts for 16 years. Um, yeah, I know that. 
yeah before moving to virginia so if somebody asks me where is my hometown i still say massachusetts you also mentioned couple of things there you started with basic and then you did c++ and this is before you getting to finish your high school uh, yeah. meaning you went to college with lot of programming background and you mentioned like more than 10000 hours of programming um one of the question i had here was like you know uh, so initially when you started you did not start with databases so we wanted to know uh, during college years and when you are you already like computers by this time so i want to know what yeah. other languages you worked on uh, before getting to databases uh, not cassandra specifically yeah sure um so when i was in school uh, i i, I was not really sure what i was going to do like um and then i took i think i actually took this class as an elective it was a uh, it was like building web applications right like pretty new stuff it was my my sequel i think it was 3.23 um with php like maybe version 3 um and then we also learned like as like old uh, asp uh and some jsp which was quite terrible um so I got, you know, I had messed around a little bit with Perl on my own, but finding there were, there was actually nowhere that I knew that I could like host it. So I was like, I ran like a geo, I had like a geo cities thing or something at one point. And I was like, okay, now I kind of want to get into more interactive stuff. Um, so I, I got into databases first as, as just a, a user. Right. So I'm, um, I built out this whole uh, project. It was called olddirtyhadad.com. And it was like a, kind of a, a, you know, play on old dirty bastard from the Wu-Tang. And uh, old dirty Haddad was a forum. It was, you could upload photos. And, and that was kind of a, that ended up being a, a final project uh, for a class, for, for that same class. And I took it and I and I ran with it for a while. I ended up rebranding it and, and actually created one of the first social networks. Um, but it was so small that like, you know, nobody nobody really knew about it unless they they met me individually. So uh, the interesting thing about it is, you know, I ran it uh, in school, but once, you know, once you're done with the class, they kind of kick you off. So all of a sudden now it's like now I now I have to find hosting. And so I've got this site, which is growing in popularity. There was, um, I think it was maybe 150,000 photos on there. There was, there was kind of a lot. You could do like bulk uploads. You could tag people in photos, which, which you couldn't even do with Facebook at the time. Like this, like I had features before Facebook uh, even added them. Uh, so the thing that ended up happening, and you got to keep in mind the specifications on these computers like when you get a, a server in 2003, like, you know, you had two or four gigs of RAM or something. So I ended up like running these database queries that eventually they just, they were like, they shut down my account. They were like, you're out of control. So I had to get into uh, performance optimization. So I was, I was very naive. I was like doing all these like crazy queries. I was joining like multiple tables and all of a sudden, you know, they're just like, bro, like no more for you. And so I had to learn a lot about, uh, you know, how to actually make databases more performant um, and, and learn about like just distributed systems and caching. And so, you know, I'm kind of teaching myself all this stuff. And then the funny thing is that I ended up moving out to California. I'm sleeping on my friend's floor. I get recruited to work at um, MySpace's parent company, Intermix. And, you know, I show up I show up at this place and it's like, I kind of had taught myself how to do all the things that they needed. And so I came in and I kind of just, you know, I became a performance guy right, right in my first job out in California. Um, so so and, one thing is about the website you just mentioned that was like a social network of friends who can post yeah. their pictures. Mm -hmm. And this was yeah. before, like, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that time was Orkut was one of the sites. Um, MySpaces was one of the sites, uh, yeah, and Facebook yeah. was not even not even Facebook. I think at that time it was just it very was, early on. Yeah, it was the Facebook, and yeah. you had to have a school email, 
um, to use it at the time. They were still, it was still just a university thing. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I thought I, I was, I thought it was interesting, but, but I was really like, I, I kind of loved doing all that stuff myself. So I was more interested in the technology than I was in the product. Of, of and the, you were, of the you were using uh, MySQL PHP kind of? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was, I did a lot with PHP for a long time because it, it just made um, the, the, what you could get done with it back when like, I didn't really get into kind of any of the, um, like any of the frameworks I, I ended up building out. I wrote all my own, all my own frameworks uh, and I got really into that. And, um, you know, it, fortunately the at Intermix, we were doing everything with PHP and then I moved on to another site called answer bag. That was all PHP and answer bag was actually the same problem. It was a, a small database with like two web servers on a cart in a colo. Yeah. And, and we went from like a hundred thousand unique visitors a month to, I think, it, I think we finished at like 17 million. And it was, it was actually pretty crazy. Like we had this thing. And so the, the interesting part about that is when you're, you know, at, and th this company now got like spun off into its own startup and I went with it and there was kind of a whole thing, but basically the, the deal is we didn't have a lot of money. And so the, the most we could get was these web servers and one database server with four gigs of RAM. And it's like, how do you handle, um, how do you efficiently like host a, a like this crazy interactive platform with only four gigs of RAM, uh, you have to make things super super efficient. So I got obsessed with databases, like like just so obsessed. I mean, also with like software architecture, like I, I designed everything. Like I was the lead on that project. I designed all of our architecture, but the the heart of it all is the database. If you can't, if you don't do your database right, then then your application really doesn't work that well. And you know when it comes to like cost we were we just had the tiniest like i said the tiniest budget so um yeah i i just fell in love with database tuning and i worked with this really great guy his name's joel downs um and we're still we're still friends and he would come up with product ideas and he'd be like hey like what do you think about this and i'd be like can't be done and he's like why don't you think about it just give me give me a, give me a day and I'd come in the next day and I'm like, oh, I know how we can do this, right? Like he, he would ask for like these things that I was just like, how are we ever going to do this? And I'd come in the next day, figure out how to build it. So we built all this stuff and, and it was it was really, really cool. Like that's when I first reached a point where it was like, uh, you know, I had database tables with billions of records. Like that was like for, for the resources that we had to be able to efficiently serve traffic with billions of records on on spinning disks four gigs of ram and just like two web servers i'm like what is going on here yeah. uh it was it was just so fun for me working with those constraints and um that just became my my passion and i i obviously i still love it like i i you know i talk about database performance a lot um and and you mentioned one thing here is the you know database design is so important uh, mm -hmm. that that hasn't changed in twenty years you know you still need yeah. to have a good design on the database uh, yeah. like we all talk about Cassandra design um, if even if you throw throw thousand servers at it if you have a bad design you know you cannot scale it uh, your database cannot handle it so that's yeah. That's yeah. like, um, I, I can see how you are getting tuned to work only on performance because you're good at it. Um, now, what we take away from this story is uh, you started with MySQL and you became really good with tuning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm guessing that you picked up some language skills during that time. Obviously, you're using all these tools. Uh, but did you write programming uh, in using C? You did you continue with C plus uh, plus? You know, I I never really went back. Like I, I did a few projects with uh, C plus um, plus, but I never really went back to it full time. Um, I did a bunch of Erlang. Uh, I, I worked at I worked at a, a couple of companies where we needed some Erlang. Um, 
I designed a like some small programming languages uh, for um, uh, God. I, I I can't even remember the the name of the the company right now because it doesn't even exist anymore. It's I think it I think it became like Brand Networks or something like that. Um, but I, I I we had this system and um, it was like a points and leaderboards type thing. And so I designed a programming language that you could use to um, to find when people would get like points and badges. It was back when like points and badges were like big. Everyone was gamifying everything. But so I, I built, yeah. So I built this like basically a, a platform where you could not only gamify everything, but you could pump arbitrary events into these systems. And then it would, it would basically through the rules engine that, that the, the language was, uh, uh, that I created, you could define how the system would react to different events that came in. So we, you basically would have custom leaderboards, you'd have custom event types, um, you could have custom badges and points that would be given out. So you could really define all your own rules. And, and so all that was written in Erlang. Uh, that was really fun. And um, are we are we talking about like 2005, 2010 now already or? Probably 2010. Yeah, I think this was. I think okay. this was. I think this was around 2010. Uh, so that brings uh, me to the question you can imagine: How did you get started with Cassandra, and who yeah. did you meet uh, as your guru? Uh, because we all got inspired by one or the other person about Cassandra. So yeah, what, I, how you so got I it? read. Yeah, there was back when I read the. Um, I got into it because I, I thought I thought there was an interesting uh, technologically, like the, the, the technical approach to how Cassandra scales was really fascinating to me. Like I thought that there was a lot of brilliance in the design. And so I ended up reading, um, I forgot, to be honest, it's been, it's been a decade. So I forgot who wrote the like the original like Cassandra book when it was talking about thrift. Um, and then I was at this company called Graph Effect which, uh, you know, they, they were, there, there was a lot of MongoDB. There was a lot of neat, there was like, we had Neo4j. It was kind of this weird situation where there was like a tech stack that, that we like, that had been decided on prior to me getting there and none of it really worked. And I was like, okay, like, how are we going to make this thing really work? Um, and so I sort of just slyly introduced Cassandra, like kind of under the radar and uh, I was working with, uh, with with two guys that are actually um, Cassandra committers now, uh, Blake Eggleston and Caleb Rackliffe. He's uh, they're, they're both committers. We 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 worked together, uh, you know, ten years ago, and um, we kind of we we put Cassandra in production, and we went from the elastic load balancer timing out at thirty seconds to all of our requests being served. Um, my mandate, like the thing that I said, was we need we. Everything needs to be under 100 milliseconds, but we shoot for 10. And so we had these like really strict goals in place that like, I don't know, I'm just sort of, I'm like, let's just shoot for the, like, let's just make it insane. And and, um, and so, you know, that's when I met like Patrick McFadden. Uh, I met uh, felt another committer on the project, Alexei. Um, you know, just smart people. Uh, Jonathan Ellis, um, you know, uh, Amy Toby, I uh, just who who I ended up working with uh, Data Stacks when when I went there later. I ended up working with Patrick and Amy, uh, who I, I just loved working with them. Uh, we had along with Luke Tillman, um, just had such a great time. Just great people, and so I was really lucky because I was able to surround myself with really really smart people. And like one of the things about data stacks that, that everybody that has worked there kind of can tell you is like the brain trust at data stacks is amazing. Like there's some super, super smart people there. And um, I, I was, you know, I was just kind of a, a lot of times I was just in the right place at the right time. So, 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 I, parallelly, people... so during this time, parallelly, you already started working at uh, last pickle or uh, during the Patrick and all that. So I, I worked, yeah, I worked with Patrick at Datastax for maybe three years. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm, one thing about me is that I'm very passionate uh, about open source. I think that, I think that there's a lot of value in, um, in just open source. Like I, I think having access to source code 
makes it possible to understand how things work. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I was getting pretty serious about that. Like I was a Cassandra user, but I, I definitely wasn't at the same kind of place that I'm at now. Uh, and DataStacks decided to pivot. I, mean, I don't know if you remember this, but for a while, DataStacks was like, we don't care about open source. We're going to focus on DataStacks Enterprise. And they, they even forked Cassandra and kind of went their own route. Um, and, you know, when, when that news hit, I was, I was really bummed out. Like, it, it, it hit me really hard. And uh, I pretty much put in my notice right away. I was like, I'm not... I'm not interested in closed source databases. This isn't, this isn't what I, 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 you know, I believe in. Um, and, uh, and you had to ask me the same question about closed source. Uh, I, I started in 97 or 96 with Oracle mm -hmm. and uh, till date, I still uh, use and manage Oracle databases. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of developed the love towards the technology because it's, it's so good. Right. Uh, nobody can deny that there is a better database in relational world. Uh, but when I started looking at Cassandra, that's when I started to, uh, you know, fall apart from loving Cass uh, Oracle and, uh, you know, walking away from the closed source. So today yeah. uh, at work, I do 50-50 because I, I still promote Cassandra at the same time I work on Oracle. But I, yeah. I, I see the the world has come to a place where open source can do so much. Why do you yeah. still want to pay money to somebody? Um, yeah. But but then let me ask you this interesting thing, right? We uh, Now we know you by different names. I want to know what is the story behind. I know why you're smiling there. Rusty <laughs> Razor Blade. Why, why Rusty? You know? Yeah. I was... Uh, so for a little while, back when I was working on Answerbag, actually, uh, I was I would go to the gym in the morning with with my coworker, a uh, guy by the name of David Gagney, great guy, and and so we're working out together, and you know we're, we're coming back uh, to the office, and right on the street there, there there it is, there's a rusty razor blade, and he goes, oh that'd be a great name for a blog. I was like, yes, that would be a great name for a blog. So I bought the domain name and and started writing on it, and then. Um, you know, I used I ended up using that same name on IRC because because the Cassandra uh, help used to be IRC. Like I don't I don't know if I don't know if you remember that, but it, it only moved to Slack. Like I don't know, not it wasn't that long. Maybe it was a few years ago. It's been several years, but it used to be everything was IRC, and so I was Rusty Razorblade there. Uh, I had RustyRazorblade.com. I had it on Twitter. Uh, it was it was just the name that I used everywhere. Now now it's like whether or not you know. I, I fortunately I, I get it. I, I enjoy it. Everybody knows it. I like it. Um, but I, I don't know if I could ever escape that name, even if I wanted to. At this so, point, I think so it's which still year, so synonymous. Which year was this uh, Rusty Razor Blade? Uh, when I bought it? Yeah. Maybe I'm gonna say 2007. Oh, that's that's a while before you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So I got, yeah, exactly. I got 20, almost 20 years of using that name now. Yeah. Um, we, so that's, that's me. I mean, that name is me. So, so as you said, right, we, you, you love people recognizing you by this uh, nickname. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what, what happens is we, some of us, we know you by the name, but we also know your nickname. We go to GitHub, we look for Rusty Razorblade or, <laughs> or your real name, we can find you. Uh, but it, it's a very interesting, unique name. You know, a lot of people have different names, uh, technology. And uh, I know if you type it on YouTube, you'll find this weird videos about how do you fix your razor blade? You know, I yeah, just shaved yeah. today morning. So, <laughs> so that's that's really funny story, uh, but very interesting on how uh, things can become part of your life, right? You're yeah. walking down the street and you see something. Uh, actually, uh, I think 90% of, of today's uh, Cassandra team recognizes you that way. Um, and I that's, guarantee that's a good it. Thing. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I think any, definitely anyone that's been in the in any of the help channels for, um, you know, any amount of time that that is definitely like 
there, there, there were actually people that knew me only by that name. Like, I, I, like there's this whole, yeah, like when people met, they're like, who's John? It's like, oh, you mean Rusty Razorblade? It's like, yeah, like everybody just knows that now. So uh, there's no turning back. Like I could change my name from John to something else. And that would be like, that would confuse fewer people than <laughs> if I were That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And and I also remember you from like, you know, uh, we, we go back like seven years or so, you had long hair with, you know, yeah. I still I still remember that look. Uh, uh, somehow you always uh, stood up differently from everybody else. Uh, you know, especially we're talking about when we went to Summit or you yep. worked with uh, Patrick on a lot of videos, like, you know, training videos. Yeah. So your working journey about Cassandra, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. You worked at Last Pickle. You worked at uh, Data Stacks. You worked at Apple, Netflix. Uh, before I was on the Cassandra side of things, I got into. Uh, I was actually a search guy, so I, I did. I did my database thing for for a while. I did my you know writing programming, writing my own programming languages. Um, but I got really into distributed search. I thought that, uh, and I still think I still love search. I think that that search is a really interesting problem. Um, this was back before Elasticsearch was a thing. I mean, I, I have put Elasticsearch into production uh, at a few different companies. I love Elasticsearch, but there was a time where Elasticsearch didn't exist, and even distributed solar, did, like there was really no option. So I actually built my own distributed search back when I was at uh, Demand Media. That's the name of it. Uh, what, what was <laughs> the name again? It was called Demand Media. I was, I was, I couldn't remember before, um, but demand media was, was a, was a fun time. Um, that was like, you know, I, I was just kind of like building, just building stuff. And, and, uh, I was kind of given, um, I'm not going to say free reign, but I definitely was just kind of like trusted to do interesting things. And so I built the distributed search that powered all, like a whole bunch of the webs of the sites behind uh, demand media. And they eventually moved everything to like Elasticsearch because I was, you know, after I left, they were like, who's going to maintain this? Like, why do we have a distributed homemade, homebrew distributed search engine? Um, but, uh, it, yeah, you don't, you don't really need that. Um, but it was, it was pretty cool at the time. So I guess, I guess me being a search guy, uh, I did graph stuff for a while. Like I mentioned Neo4j, but, uh, we actually, before I put, uh, Cassandra in production just for Cassandra. I actually put Cassandra in production to use with Titan. And Titan, I, I was, I think, um, I think we were one of the only people that actually put Titan in production. We were, we were definitely the um, pretty loud about it. Uh, Blake Eggleston, who I already mentioned, he he eventually became a committer on Titan because he fixed a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but that that that's when I kind of got into graph optimization, and so. You know, I had to understand the storage engine of Cassandra really well because Titan ran on Cassandra. Um, and eventually we ended up moving off Titan and I just ended up using Cassandra directly. And that's really when we kind of got like the performance that we wanted because like I knew what the storage engine could do. I knew how it was supposed to work and I kind of took advantage of it. Um, so it was kind of it was kind of an interesting path to get there. Um, and so, and maybe, I see yeah. I see how, uh, you know, we still talking about the open source, the, the love you have towards open source. Um, not spending too much time, but recently one of your friend contacted you said, hey, something changed on Cassandra 5 and uh, we are unable to get the metrics out. And you wrote a 40 line program. <laughs> Can you give us, what was your uh, mindset on that project? And you wrote it a couple of hours you spent, like maybe three hours, and then that program was working well. So yeah. tell me this project. Yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone, you, uh, we were talking about how um, the state of pulling metrics out of Cassandra and how, um, I believe it's like the, what was it? Add this metrics reporter uh, was removed from Cassandra. And you, and you had asked me, how would we get metrics out? Um, and so I had actually, it, it's interesting because I had been wanting an excuse to do something with this for a while now. And 
the thing about all of the metrics reporters that have existed is that they have relied on JMX. And the problem with JMX is that it's it's very heavyweight. And there's a few reasons for it. Uh, depending on, on which metrics tool that you use, they might either be loading metrics from externally, in which case the JMX communication is really slow. Or if they're doing it internally, there's a, uh, I think that there's actually some issues with the security manager uh, dragging down performance. But the thing is that all the metrics are in the Drop Wizard metrics library. So like going through JMX is kind of pointless. So if you know what you want, it actually makes a lot more sense to uh, to use the the Drop Wizard metrics directly. And so uh, yeah, that, that's when I, I threw together a quick agent uh, for you. Um, feel free to you know share that repo. It's very much proof of concept. Um, and I know that you took it and, and you made some changes to it, uh, but yeah, I would, I would really love, I would actually love to see us take this, um, productionize it a little bit more. And if somebody out there is, is, is interested in that, uh, you know, that could be a fun little project for us to work on together. Um, so, but, so just uh, to, just to poke some fun at it, right. Uh, basically the code you wrote, uh, just to explain, uh, we directly go and register to the Drop Wizard Metrics registry, and your code uh, listens to all the changes. And whenever we ask for, hey, give me metrics, uh, basically it's a 40 line Java code, uh, it will expose all those Cassandra metrics as a Prometheus endpoint. So yeah. you just go to this uh, small endpoint and you can scrape all the Prometheus uh, formatted metrics. And the whole thing is happening in less than two seconds from drop wizard metrics to exposing them. So that's pretty efficient, right? Uh, as I said, I'm going to poke fun at something. MCSE, which is the official you know, uh, metrics collector for Apache Cassandra, that project- From, from data stacks, from data stacks. It's not the official. From data stacks, okay. Yeah. So has 3,800 lines of Java code. Yeah. Compared to what you wrote is 40 lines Java code. So. Yeah, that just tells me how good you are at uh, you know doing what you do, uh, the performance <laughs> tuning. Um, so, John, recently you've been very actively writing uh, blog posts, and uh, you've been doing a lot of live sessions on YouTube. Um, yeah. So, Cassandra enthusiasts, like you know, whoever want to learn more stuff, they can definitely use your resources. Um, but what is your uh, idea of this blog post and the YouTube, uh, how we can use it more effectively. Uh, just tell us why you are doing it. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that, that we found uh, at the last pickle, and this was, this was definitely a, uh, a cultural thing, um, was, and, and this is probably, this might be counterintuitive, but we found that the more information that we shared and the more open we were and the, the more we helped people, the better we did as a company. So, you know, if let's let's take a, a, a post that was that was probably one of the most um, successful posts I wrote. It was it was about massively scalable time series. In fact, I'm, I'm doing a, a live stream uh, coming up on, on the same uh, topic. Uh, you would think that by putting all this information out there and making it available for free, that it would cannibalize the, you know, our, our potential customer base. But the reality is that all it, all it really does is one, help people, right? Two, if they get help out of this, then they recognize that we're, we're serious about what we do and, if there is something else that they want to try and solve, then it's a good thing to kind of, they could just reach out to us and we would do it. We didn't put any, like we didn't put a single dollar into marketing at the last pickle. We literally did not buy any ads. It, that, it was literally just the blog. And we, all of our incoming uh, customers were either referred, like there, there was a referral from an old customer or people that came in and read the blog and they were like, oh, we need to, we need to work with you. Um, 
so it was a lot of the writing and there was like a, a tombstone post that was that was very very popular written by alan rodriguez uh there was my time series post um everyone had everyone had good content that that helped the community and so by making by helping people be successful with apache cassandra we did a few things we one established our own credibility and two we helped the community grow so if if we and i feel i really truly believe that that the work that we did had a, a significant impact on the community if we were able to make the community grow then that just means that there's more opportunities for us and more people that we can work with the success of Cassandra is fundamental to a company that provides Cassandra services. And so the, the more I can do to help people be successful with Cassandra, the better it is for the community. And then as a result, the better it is for me. So I take a very un, uh, odd view, I guess, where I try to be as helpful as possible. I try to put as much information out into the world as possible uh, because I believe that that will come back. And because of the work that I'm doing, because of the, the knowledge that I'm sharing, that may not be obvious. Like some of the things that we've shared are, are very counterintuitive, even to originally when we started working on them, like the, the project had uh, a whole bunch of ideas about how you should configure your system. And, you know, there was very common, it was common knowledge, but it was wrong. And so we were able to kind of change the way that people run Cassandra, help them be successful. And now as a result, it's it's one of the most popular databases on the planet. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I would, I would, I feel a lot more comfortable with myself if I know that I'm being a helpful person. Like that's just kind of what drives me. I, I really, really like to be helpful. And, um, you know, I, 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 I'm hoping that the same, I'm hoping that that mindset, that that attitude continues to be a thing that, that, you know, makes me successful. Uh, and now that I'm, you know, now that I'm back, uh, consulting again, this, not under the, the last pickle brand, but under my own brand, just as Rusty Razorblade, the consultant, I, uh, I'm hoping that as people find my my YouTube channel, as people interact with me, they kind of realize that that you know we can actually build some awesome stuff. We can be successful, um, and you know I'm hoping that that pays dividends to me down the line. Um, right. And it you know and with my career it has like I've been I've been been really fortunate. That's the type of thing that has that got us uh, a lot of customers. That got us you know was able to get me um, in a position to work at Apple and at Netflix. Um, and to be honest, I also learn a lot from writing. So I don't always know everything I'm going to write up front. Sometimes I have to figure things out. So, you know, along the way I'm picking up things and I want to make sure that I'm presenting accurate information to the world. So I'll go ahead and read through source code and I'll double check, triple check things. I run all the benchmarks. I'm like, if I'm going to give people advice, I want to make sure I'm right. I want statistics. I want I want to be as accurate as possible. Uh, I hate the idea of, of putting something out there and just being totally wrong. Um, Actually, that so. that mindset completely aligns with uh, open source. You know, the reason we write this code and make it available for free. Uh, so my hope is somebody takes my code and makes it better. So I can mm -hmm. come back and use the better version of what I wrote. Yeah. So that is that is why I do it. Now, <clears throat> training and uh, the blog post or the knowledge sharing uh, also aligns with that. Uh, basically, the mindset yeah. is, uh, as you said, we do a lot of research before we uh, really put out a blog post or something, uh, a YouTube video, for example. Um, it is It is very taxing. You know, it takes a lot of time. And yeah. people have to realize uh, if I'm asking for ten dollars for piece of content, it was created after working maybe forty fifty hours of research mm -hmm. and about hundred hours of putting it together. So yeah. it's it's not like um, 
you know, using the artificial intelligence, we cannot create a one hour video, which makes any yeah. sense, you know, so that, yep. that really we appreciate uh, when you, when you do things like going into kernel code, Linux kernel code, which <laughs> happened like last week, <laughs> I was watching that. I say, what? You're touching the kernel code right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's kind of wild. It's, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm like a, I'm like, honestly, like a dog with a bone. I'm like, I want to know how this thing works and I can go down a real rabbit hole. Like I don't, it, it's hard for me to let go of, uh, of questions. So if I'm like, why does this behave this way? You know, uh, I, I, I know you're talking about uh, the video I, I did yeah. where I was talking about uh, eBPF and how you can tap into like what's going on in the kernel. And like, I end up reading a bunch of kernel source. So I understand what I want to hook into so I can collect metrics and like, and understand what's going on. Um, um, so, so uh, I want to let you know that we, we love your curiosity because we are learning so much new things. Um, you know, when, when you're curious on a live session, you're looking at kernel code, say, okay, why did I, why did I not do that last time? You know, yeah. so that, yeah. uh, that actually brings us, uh, all the people who are enthusiasts, like, you know, to the next level, they say, Hey, I should be more curious. Uh, maybe look at some Java code, which, which is how does the time series, uh, compaction runs, right? Time window compaction. Um, yeah. I know when to use it. I, I don't know how to use it. Uh, then mm -hmm. I, I can look at the source code. So that's that's really a good thing. Um, also, uh, during uh, past uh, few days, let's say, a recent newsletter you put out, uh, you uh, declared that you're going to do a training session. Um, yes. So give us more details about when this is going to happen. Who are the audience for this training session? And especially when you're talking, it's like a PhD class, right? Master class. So Thank you. definitely give us uh, what we need to know to prepare ourselves for this training. Yeah. So the, the training, uh, I got the idea for this specific training uh, when we were planning on doing a training for the Cassandra Summit. Uh, so I worked with Axon Ops to basically do kind of this AMA style. Uh, you know, we just show up and people just ask whatever they want. And so I, I realized that it would be really, really helpful if there was a training program that was available for folks that, that already knew a little bit about Cassandra. So, you know, if, especially since like DataStacks has done such a good job, job with DataStacks Academy, uh, you have your training. There's the, the training is there's a lot of good options to get to get started right now with Cassandra, but there's not a lot of people that are out there sharing what they've learned working at like the kind of scale that I've been lucky enough to work at. So when I was at like the last pickle, like, you know, some of the folks that I work with, some of the biggest deployments in the world. And then all of a sudden I'm at Apple and it's like the biggest one in the world. Then I'm at Netflix and it's the second biggest. And it's like the sheer volume of stuff that I got to see through, through working there, both as like a committer trying to get Cassandra 4 out uh, and as an operator, as a developer, like I, cause I've used Cassandra in every single capacity. Um, it's, I, I think that I have a pretty unique perspective. Like I don't, there's nobody else in the world that's worked at data stacks, the last pickle, Netflix and Apple. It's just, it, it, it they, there's just not that entire uh, group. Um, so my training course kind of picks up at the idea of you've run Cassandra in production or you've run it on your own and you've tested it, you've kicked the tires, but you're not necessarily confident that you could join like a team that has 10, 20 clusters, you know, a thousand nodes, maybe it's, you know, one of these more challenging environments, you're not really sure about performance tuning. My goal is to, is to take people that are, let's say, beginner to intermediate and bring them into the expert level. So this is hands-on, uh, you know, we're, we're really kind of get into it. Like I'm gonna explain kind of best practices that I've learned along the way 
Um, ones that aren't, aren't really intuitive. Like we talked about, um, you know, time series. There's ways that you can make a time series, uh, you know, data model scale much better than just using a single partition. In fact, this is this is going to be the topic for, uh, you know, a video, a, a live stream that I'm going to be doing soon. Um, I want to share what I've learned along the way. And so the, the thing that I've also learned is that as a consultant, I can only help so many people at once. Like I'm only helping one team at a time. If you, you know, if you engage me for two, three weeks or a month, like I can help your team, but how, like, you know, that that's your environment. It's very specific to you. Um, but, you know, we're talking, we're going back and forth. Like you're not taking anything away. And not everyone, not every company is willing to kind of commit to that. What I decided was I want to help other people get to where I am uh, by sharing what I know. And so that's that's why I, I'm, I announced the training. Uh, so I'm working on it now. I'm, I'm really, really excited. Uh, we already have, I already have people that are in the class. Um, this is, so there's a, and I'm limiting it to 20, stu 20 students. So it's going to be a hands-on, eight-week-long class, 90 minutes uh, per week, uh, and it's starting in April. So if, if yeah, if someone wants to, if someone wants to become way better at running Cassandra and and you know be able to take kind of a, a lead position at like uh, you know a bank or a streaming media company or or get or get on or have a chance of getting in, involved with a you know with a Netflix. Or uh, you know one of these other big companies that are running Cassandra, like a CrowdStrike, this is the fastest path to get there. And so there's going to be a ton. It's not just the in-class stuff. It's a ton of video content that I'm working on. Um, so there's actually going to be more video content than hours in the class. So it's 12 hours of class time, but there's going to be over that in video content. So if you you know you might do this stuff with me in class, and then maybe you don't remember it forever. You're going to have a lifetime access to the videos. Um, there's all the, the material that's going to become that's coming along with it is things that have been proven at the largest scale in the world. And so, you know, we, we're we're not I'm not talking about like hypothetical situations. I'm talking about real proven uh, technological choices that that make sense that that deliver um, the absolute best cluster performance. And reliability that you can ask for. Uh, so, whether you're a developer, th uh, this this one's really focused on operators. So, the name of the class is Operator Excellence. So, I, I want I nice. want everybody to come out of this to be amazing at running Cassandra. Um, but I'm also going to be doing a developer class, and uh, I'm I'm really excited. Uh, um, Jordan West, uh, who's uh, at Netflix, is is helping uh, build this. He's he's going to be teaching. Uh, some of it sharing what he knows. Um, he's also a committer, definitely one of the the best people I've ever worked with. We we had to, we had to fix a few Netflix uh, Cassandra issues together, and and he's uh, super professional. Um, absolutely, just just great great person. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm just so excited. Uh, yeah. So if if someone's looking to just step up their game, this is probably the 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 cheapest, fastest way to do it. We're going to be working together. Uh, think of it as a team managing a cluster that has a lot of stuff wrong with it. You're going to learn how to uh, build a control plane, all the things that are important, the factors that, that go into building a control plane, uh, diagnosing performance problems, handling availability issues. Uh, just there's a, there's kind of this long, long, long list, list of, of things. That, yeah, it's it's if you were to... Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I, I yeah. I'm so excited for this. I I can tell you right now. It's it's just uh, so much excitement to learn, uh, because resources is difficult to find. You know, somebody who wants to teach uh, passionately, and I see that in your eyes right now while you're explaining, <laughs> just explaining the topics list. You know, you're yeah. so passionate about it. Um, we talked about the blogs, YouTube, uh, the training, but tell us about your consulting services. You recently set up your own consulting and um, how you're helping companies uh, so that if somebody wants to approach you, uh, 
what kind of role you'll go help them uh, to work with Cassandra? Yeah, um, there. So I've I got again right place at the right time. Um, so when I left Netflix, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I, I actually was kind of in this like weird uh, uh, state. Netflix was doing a bunch of layoffs. Uh, my whole like there's a whole team that got laid off basically. Uh, and so you know I'm I'm like okay, what am I going to do now? And the thing that that I, I made a list. I basically took like all the things that I I loved about the work that I've done over the years, and you know I, I love like I said before I love helping people, uh, and I loved the work that I did at, at TLP. Like TL, I loved working at the Last Pickle. It was it was amazing. My coworkers were so incredible. Just very very high functioning. Uh, just great, great people. And, um, and so I was like, well, you know, it, it's kind of obvious now I want to, I want to get back into this, but it was terrifying because I was like, I don't know how to find customers. And I happened to get really, really lucky. I can't, I can't give out any names. Um, but I ended up helping uh, a fairly large uh, bank with a lot of performance tuning across about a thousand uh, Cassandra nodes. And so helping them out with not, eventually, you know, we, we ended up doing a lot more than that. It wasn't just performance tuning. It, it ended up being quite a bit more. Um, and I loved working with them. They're a great team. And, you know, for me to be able to come in and, and if someone, if someone has issues with their cluster, then, and I'm able to, to help with it, like the impact that it has in their lives makes their lives a little bit easier. They're a little bit happier. Uh, their customers are happier. To me, it's a no-brainer, and you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, bringing bringing an, in an outsider. I think some folks are kind of uh, intimidated by it. Can be a little, it can be a little uh, humbling, really, to be like, we don't know enough to to do this. Um, but the the savings through both mental savings through through stress. And honestly, the, the return that you get monetarily uh, always 100% of the time uh, ends up being worth it. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we work on something for like six months and uh, as a result, you're able to cut your cluster in half. Like all of a sudden you're like, oh, like, you know, if you're running a thousand nodes, you're, you're looking at like, well over a million dollars uh, a year in cloud costs, for example. So, right. you know, you cut that in half and it's like, you know, you, you invest a little bit, you know, I come in and help you out and all of a sudden, you know, now, now you save a million dollars a year. It's very, very worthwhile. Uh, so, you know, I'm able to help people kind of increase node density, decrease downtime, help with control plane planning, uh, help cloud migrations, data migrations, data modeling. Uh, I've done some really, really wild data modeling over the years, and it's it's one of those things that's always fun. And as we talked about earlier, it's like it can make or break the application. So getting it right is so important, and getting it getting it there's this mentality that like you're just going to be able to come in and fix things later magically. It's like the technical debt from doing an improper data model, from not taking a couple extra days to do a good data model up front. It's like you could be looking at months of migrations. Uh, when Netflix moved from Thrift to CQL, there was one database cluster that got moved manually and the app had to get rewritten and it was a two year migration process. Wow. So if, if every time that you need to change your data model, if it's this like enormous process, the, the cost becomes astronomical. So it's like, it's a lot better to just come in, do it right the first time. And, and that's where I like, uh, you know, that's where I can help people a lot. So I've helped on a lot of greenfield projects. I've helped refactor things. I've helped improve things over time. And again, like the performance analysis is always the thing that I kind of come in and I'm like, um, usually people think they know what's wrong and uh, almost never are they correct. It's, it's, it's usually something that, that people had no idea would impact them. And, and, you know, if you're thorough, you can find this stuff, but uh, it can be a little tricky sometimes. So, um, 
yeah, I, I, I really, like I said, I really love, I, I love coming in and helping help the teams out that way. So, so one point you mentioned there, a lot of people underestimate uh, the cloud cost. Um, mm-hmm. What happens is we, we all, um, I mean, I at least started with uh, having big servers, uh, but now uh, for about 20 years now, yeah, not 20 years, maybe 15, 15 years, a lot of people talk about, oh, we are doing cloud migrations. Mm -hmm. Everybody is excited about going to cloud, but a lot of people don't optimize that going to cloud, right? (laughs) Basically, uh, we say, oh, we have all all these resources. I can write a very small Lambda, which will spin out like 20 servers to do my job, but Mm -hmm. they forget to optimize it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, cloud cost can go up really, really fast. Uh, So I think it's, it's a wonderful investment for a company to bring you in take that expert advice on how to manage it for the next two years, right? Yeah. You're spending only two months to three months training the team, but the savings they have for next few years in cloud, uh, probably they will stay in cloud for longer yeah. time because they know how to manage it, right? So yeah. that's a great um, great value, I, I definitely think. So, uh, so great, we talked about several topics here, uh, uh, we we love the blogs, YouTube. Keep keep doing the live sessions if possible. Keep hacking every, the every kernel Tuesday. every <laughs> Tuesday, man. Yeah. Every two, I'm I'm uh, with you know unless I'm on vacation, uh, expect something every Tuesday at, at 10 a.m. Uh, yeah, Pacific. That's like that's my that, that works for me. I'm like I'm in it now. Um, yeah, they're, I, they're I'm, amazing. I'm, they're amazing sessions. The topics you're picking up are are really difficult to talk about. Uh, you know, it's not easy to explain. Performance tuning is one of the difficult topics. Um, and since you're passionate about it, we we are excited to see what else you will do with it. Um, all the best for the training. And I definitely hope this platform helps a lot of other people to know uh, that the training is upcoming in April. Uh, I'll. I'll post whatever links are possible in the description of the YouTube video. Um, And uh, definitely all the best for the consulting and uh, hope we'll talk soon. You know, thank you for spending this time uh, talking about Cassandra and, uh, you know, explaining us how you got here. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Cool. Thank you. All righty.